Water. Hi, everybody. I think we ought to uh, get started so we have plenty of time. Uh, we still have some. Come on in, John. So, all right, thank you very much. Um, this is a very special occasion for several reasons. First of all, it's Oli Teen House's first Grand Rounds as chair, and we're delighted to have you here. And secondly, we're very fortunate to have Tor Wager as our speaker. I've been asked to tell you that he has nothing to disclose. That's with regard to financial conflicts of interest, but he has a great deal to disclose with regard to pain and emotion. Because despite his tender years, Tor is one of the world's leading authorities on the neural basis of placebo effects, and relatedly is also a world-class researcher on the neural bases of emotion and emotion regulation. Tor was initially invited to Tucson by the Cognitive Science Program, where he'll be speaking on Friday about similarities and differences in the brain between physical pain and the social pain of rejection. He'll be spending most of tomorrow hosted by the highly successful pain research program here in our Department of Pharmacology. And I think it's notable that Frank Pareka, who happens to be here in the audience, who's head of the pain research program, strongly encouraged everyone in his lab to attend all three of Tor's talks because he is a brilliant scientist who can help us better understand the, the mechanisms of interaction between pain and emotion. Uh, in 2010, uh, Tor became the director of the Cognitive and Effective Control Laboratory and associate professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He moved there after five years at Columbia University in New York, where he was an assistant professor. I think it's remarkable that it's only been nine years uh, uh, since 2003 when Tor got his PhD in psychology at the University of Michigan. And that particular year, he was lead author on a seminal paper in science on, on brain mechanisms of placebo using fMRI. He currently uh, has three NIH grants, is widely sought after as a speaker and consultant. I think it's a testament to his special abilities that he continues to run labs in both Boulder and at Columbia in New York. Tor has been a leader in creating new neuroimaging methods that have made some of his remarkable discoveries possible. And Relatedly, for the past four to five years, he's run the day-long advanced fMRI program fMRI workshop at the annual human brain mapping meeting, which is going to be held in Beijing this coming year. Just to give you two examples of Tor's innovations, he created a program to combine results from multiple neuroimaging studies from meta-analyses that pinpoint exactly where in the brain significant effects occur. This has been used, for example, to demonstrate that different basic emotions like happiness, sadness, and disgust do not have a unique neural circuitry of their own as has been commonly thought. He secondly adapted the statistical principles of mediation analysis to the brain imaging environment uh, so that he and now others can show how the brain mediates the relationship between psychological states such as stress on the one hand and changes in peripheral physiology such as heart rate that are due to stress. In recognition of this work, as well as his many other contributions, the American Psychosomatic Society made toward the first recipient of a new award for outstanding neuroscience research in psychosomatic medicine in 2010, and just selected him to join the governing board, which leads the organization. To top it off, Tor is also a very special human being. Uh, he's the primary caretaker of two adorable children, and is, at his young age, I think a rather wise person. As he said to me recently, I believe in giving people the benefit of the doubt way beyond what is reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> so it there, therefore gives me great pleasure to ask Tor to come to the podium to speak to you about the neural bases of placebo effects and pain. Tor.
Well, thank you for that um, very generous and somewhat embarrassing introduction. Um, it's, you know, you, 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 you don't know. You, you never know when somebody's going to, uh, to to say something that you say to them in a in a talk. So. <laughs> But that's nice. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here to speak to you today and, and to meet all of you. And I hope to be able to, you know, say hello and, and, and meet as many of you as possible um, today and or tomorrow should you, should you choose to return um, in the future uh, for other talks. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, placebo effects in pain and sort of the story that's developed. Um, we all suffer, and avoiding suffering is one of the fundamental pursuits of human life. Um, this is true to such an extent that many of the philosophical institutions and traditions and spiritual traditions that we have are centered around uh, avoiding suffering so that we can become free to choose our own paths um, and to enjoy our lives. And this is perhaps what prompted the Stoic Marcus Aurelius to write, if you're distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to revoke at any moment. And that's certainly a, an optimistic sentiment, uh, and that's also one that's been shared uh, by practitioners throughout history. Um, this bathroom reminds me that there are over 4,000 ancient remedies that were documented by the historian uh, and scientist Arthur Shapiro. Um, many of them, they're from bat's wings to eyes of newts and, and other things. Um, almost all of the effects of these treatments are now attributable to placebo, uh, to the belief itself in the treatment. Um, some of them were even deadly. Uh, one of my favorites is a treatment in the 1800s in the U.S. for yellow fever that involved bleeding out of the human body more blood than is actually in the human body. And in spite of this dangerous cure, uh, this physician remained um, prominent and successful for many years. <laughs> This is Hippocrates, uh, so th this is true from ancient times in both Eastern and Western medicine to modern ones. Uh, Hippocrates wrote this, the patient, though conscious that his condition is perilous, may recover his health simply through his contentment with the goodness of the physician. And on the other side of the world, this is from the Yellow Emperor's inner classic, uh, original um, acupuncture text. If a patient does not consent to therapy with positive engagement, the physician should not proceed as the therapy will not succeed. <laughs> um, this goes through the 1900s in the U.S. This is Richard Cabot from Harvard saying that um, everybody essentially treats people with placebo pills, with sham treatments um, from time to time. And today, 45% uh, is... Number one, the number of Americans who use prayer for health reasons. Um, and number two, the number of physicians who, in a recent study, reported using placebo treatments in their clinical practice. Um, and by the way, 96% of those physicians believed that, uh, that placebos could be effective. And this, 30, almost $34 billion, is the out-of-pocket expenditures for alternative health care in 2007, despite very little actual uh, scientific evidence that many of these treatments um, are, are, are effective. Um, and $28 billion is the total NIH budget um, that year, same year. <laughs> so people are spending more money on, on really you know, treatments that they believe in than, than we actually are spending doing research on them. Um, the point of this talk really is to ask this question. Uh, can beliefs be helpful in relieving pain in a meaningful way? Um, and by meaningful, I'll tell you what I mean, but we're, we're going to try to look for some objective neurophysiological evidence um, that they're helping. But let's start with a couple of, of clinical examples. Placebo treatments or sham treatments can be effective in a variety of clinical situations. This is uh, an example um, here from a review article by Coloca and Benedetti um, showing some of their data. And this is two drugs, one um, opiate-based, one not. And if you look at this dark purple line, um, what you see is the time course of improvement. Uh, this is the injection period here. This is several hours afterwards. Pain goes down, and then it comes back up later. So this all looks good. Now if you look at the light blue line, this is the response to that treatment when the patient doesn't know that it's getting it, that they're, that, they're, that they're receiving it. So it's given in a hidden manner. And there you see um, much reduced benefit. 
Um, so whether a patient knows they're getting a treatment can actually make a substantial benefit, uh, have a substantial effect on the overall treatment response. Another kind of example comes from uh, really several large-scale trials of acupuncture that have been done recently. And in this one, there were um, over 1,000 people um, across many centers throughout Germany. And what you see here on, this, on the y-axis here is the percentage of patients that showed uh, pain relief uh, over a sort of a prolonged period of treatment. I think it was six weeks. And <clears throat> this is the standard care, so you get about a 35% improvement. And it turns out that, um, uh, and this involves both physical therapy and, and drugs, um, that acupuncture um, was substantially more beneficial. So highly significant, clinically meaningful um, improvement over the standard of care. But they also had a sham acupuncture group, um, which involved uh, the same kind of procedure, um, but they didn't get the actual acupuncture, real acupuncture stimulation at, at those sites. And what happened is, it's also substantially better than the standard of care and not statistically different from the, the, the virum, the real acupuncture treatment. So what's happening? Either the standard care is bad, which is actually a less likely alternative, or the sham acupuncture itself is, um, can be effective, is effective in this case, at relieving pain. So um, on the one hand, you know, this has culminated, this is a, in this kind of headline from the, the New York Times a few years ago, placebo has proved so powerful, even experts are surprised. And we were working on our initial studies at the time this came out, and I thought, oh, they have it all sewn up. Okay, we better not, not do research. Uh, but it turns out, you know, a couple of years later, um, the New York Times published this headline, <laughs> placebo is more myth than science. <laughs> And uh, this was done after uh, a pair of Danish scientists, Robot Shin and Gotcha, published an influential paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. And what they found was across um, many different um, conditions, many different medical conditions, um, there were significant placebo effects in continuous outcomes, but not outcomes that are binary in nature, like did you quit smoking or did you not? Did you live or did you die? But these sort of continuous, more subjective outcomes they found evidence for, some of the largest effects were found in pain. And nevertheless, they concluded that there were no real placebo effects and that the effects that did exist in these clinical trials in, 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 in pain were, were really because of a, a sampling bias or statistical artifacts or patients simply um, reporting what the physicians wanted them to hear, the so-called demand characteristic. So which one of these two stories you believe um, probably depends on how you think about pain <laughs> and what it is in the brain. And, and this is really what I'd call an old model, feed-forward model of pain. This might, it might be even pre-1960. Pre um, but there's this idea that there's organic pain, which is, is what's coming up the spinal cord, nociceptive afferents, and that through some centers here leads to this pain sensation um, and then produces uh, reports. And if this is true, and there's this, this, this difference between organic pain and other kinds of, of influences, psychological pain and distress and just being afraid and other kinds of things like that, um, then these other kinds might just actually influence the output process, the reporting process i.e. your judgments and decisions about the pain and not the actual uh, stuff coming up. <laughs> right. And if this is the case, then all effects of placebo and all other cognitive interventions and cognitive therapies um, are post-nociception. They're about your decision-making process. But we've known for a long time um, that that's actually not the case in the brain. Uh, it looks something more like this. There's a a recurrent process in your pain group people, um, you know, Frank Perka and, 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 and others in, in the group, you know, do very detailed studies of something I've just drawn a big arrow over here. <laughs> 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 but, you know, there's this, sure, there's this ascending feed forward process that ultimately ends up in verbal behavior reports, but there's also these descending feedback at multiple levels of the neuroaxis, you know, starting from uh, the, the, the most ventral parts of the medulla on down. And that, uh, in this case, it's possible that thoughts and feelings can not only influence what you say and what you decide, but also influence uh, nociception and, and the creation of the pain experience at a deeper level. 
So this distinction between these two ideas really drives the need for brain-based measures. Are placebo effects really about decision-making biases and cultural norms and, and other things which we know can influence the relationship between what you essentially experience and what you, what you end up saying, what you communicate, unfortunately, um, or is it measuring something else? And the brain can help us do that. And in my lab, we take what you might describe as an integrative neuroscience approach. Um, looking at evidence from multiple different kinds of methodologies. Um, now we've used um, the two that are here, uh, which I'll mainly focus on today, and, as well as some other ones to try to address this question. Um, over here on the right, you might all be familiar with this, um, but just in case you need a refresher, this is the fMRI scanner. Um, most of the studies I'll talk about use this scanner. And the beauty of what it can do is it can assess activity across a living human brain uh, in about two seconds, give or take, um, and it can make about 200,000 different measurements of activity in the brain. And so, so you really get this rich data on the brain dynamics um, uh, uh, unfolding over time. The other methodology here, PET, is neurochemistry, is really good for, for assessing um, endogenous neurochemical effects. And um, those include, for placebo studies, especially opioids and dopamine. And the idea is to inject a radioactively labeled ligand a tracer into the bloodstream, it binds in the brain, and where there's endogenous activity of, let's say, opioids, it competes with the labeled uh, radio tracer at those binding sites, resulting in a drop of binding, in which case one can infer that there's actually a, a release of endogenous opioids or dopamine. And the contributions of, of neuroscience to this problem at a broad level uh, are twofold. First, it can give us an idea about the mechanism. Um, which brain systems are involved in placebo analgesia, in creating it? That can give us ideas about where and how we should intervene. It also can give us ideas about the plausibility of what those systems are relative to what we know neurophysiologically is involved in regulating nociception and the creation of pain experiences. <laughs> um, a second thing that it can give us is what I'll call intermediate markers. Or you might call them uh, endogenous uh, phenotypes and endophenotypes as well. Um, and this is really a brain pattern or activity in a, in a, in a brain region that can tell us something about um, uh, how early and which brain processes are actually affected. So uh, an intermediate marker for pain would be one that tracks pain experience. And so in the talk today, um, I'll use brain measures that we know are influenced by changes in pain experience and that track changes in pain experience. And those will serve as surrogate markers. Um, and we're actually working very hard now to try to improve those markers so that we have brain patterns that can sensitively and specifically track pain experience and therefore serve as you know, biological objective correlates. Um, which can then be tested for placebo effects. And this is the idea of multiple feedback loops through these brain stem systems here, and then back down to the spinal cord. This is the PAG in the midbrain. I'll focus on this. And the idea here is that there are multiple layers of control. So we first saw these, I'll just maybe I'll play it one more time. Um, we first saw these brain stem systems. There's the ascending nociceptive systems, and then there's descending systems. And this is through the hypothalamus out to the body. There's this intermediate layer of control by the subcortex, the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens. And then finally, there's this cortical layer of control, which is really centered on the VMPFC, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex here, the hippocampus, and the posterior cingulate. And this sort of triangle, um, I'll, I'll get back to again at the end of the talk. But for now, I'll just point out that this is the only area of the cortex, to my knowledge, that sends projections all the way back down to the lowest levels of the, um, of, of the brain stem nuclei that regulate autonomic output to the body and that can regulate uh, nociceptive transmission as well. So this is, has a privileged anatomical connectivity with these lower brain stem centers as well. And regarding the second point, these preliminary intermediate markers, um, this is a, a pattern of activity, and in these maps that I'll show you, these are slices, this is a sagittal slice to the side of the head, these are axial slices from bottom to top <laughs> going through the head, 
and the bright colored spots are areas, in this case, that, that track reliably um, an increase in painful stimulus intensity. So high pain versus low pain uh, in each of these areas. And this pattern is one that is really very reliable. And, and uh, among all the phenomena that I know of in the cognitive affect of neurosciences, it's actually one of the most stable and reliable ones. And so you can see here the anterior cingulate cortex, the thalamus. This is the PAG in the midbrain that I pointed out. There's the cerebellum. There's the insula, the anterior insula, and the dorsal posterior insula in S2, and, and some other regions as well. Uh, so what we're going to do is look for placebo effects on activity essentially in this pattern. <laughs> and because I take my task here today to give you a sort of summary of all the stuff that's happening in this area that's interesting, um, I'll, I'll summarize it in this way. There really are four different kinds of evidence now that have been brought to bear on this question of, of placebo analgesia. And the first and oldest one has to do with pharmacology. In particular, uh, experimental administration of the opioid antagonist naloxone, um, which um, was done first, actually, in, in, in the late 70s uh, by John Levine and Howard Fields. And what they found was that um, giving naloxone could reverse a placebo effect, in some cases, in their case, without actually changing pain itself. So it selectively blocked a placebo effect. And that, to me, sort of put placebo back on the map as a potentially real um, pharmacologically and neurophysiologically real phenomenon to be explained. Um, it suggests that it's not just, uh, not just, just, just uh, demand characteristics or reporting biases. I'm also talk in some more detail about brain activity studies with fMRI and PET, uh, including a number of these that you'll see here. Um, a third source of evidence is, I won't, I won't talk about too much, but it exists, is on um, event-related potentials in electroencephalography. Um, and these studies collectively show um, reduced uh, markers of early nociceptive processing with placebo treatment. So there's a characteristic potential, the N1P2 complex, and usually in these, ca in these cases, people use a laser and they give little pinpricks of pain. <laughs> And when you get a pinprick of pain and you have a placebo treatment that you think is going to be helpful, then it'll help. <laughs> and that, that potential will be reduced. And then the fourth is the neurochemistry or PET studies, and particularly uh, opioid and dopamine studies. So those are the four kinds of evidence. So now I'll take you through some of the results that, um, that my lab and other labs have found over the past uh, eight years or so. And, and what they mean in terms of the study of placebo analgesia overall. Before I do it, I just want to walk you through what the actual study looks like, at least a thumbnail sketch at a, a basic level. So here I'll talk about um, two studies, a pair of studies that were published together. Study one is electric shock on the right arm, the 24 people, and study two is a thermal pain study on the left arm. So two different modalities, uh, two different um, arms, and what we did in this case was look for effects that replicated across both studies, uh, placebo effects that replicated across both studies. And the idea is this. Once a participant is in, this, is in, the, um, is in the scanner, um, we give them a cue that says, uh, get ready, um, get ready. And there's an anticipation period. And then there's this heat that comes on, or shock. Uh, in this case, they're experiencing the heat, then they rest, and then they rate the pain, and then they rest some more. And the idea is that we can separately assess the fMRI activity related to the anticipation of pain when you're preparing for pain itself and compare that with and without a placebo treatment. Um, we can assess pain-related activity during the experience itself and then separate those things from the activity that happens when you're actually judging the pain itself. And that's the idea. All right. And... Um, the setup of the experiment goes something like this. In this case, first, we do this sort of calibration on the skin. And the idea is to give people different temperatures and choose temperatures that correspond to uh, low, medium, and high subjective pain levels for them, called those 2, 5, and 8, where 8 is near as hot as they can stand. And then we would apply placebo and control creams. So the creams are actually identical creams. The only difference is in the instructions that we give to participants. 
So when we apply the placebo cream on this, arm, on this patch of skin here on the arm, we might say, this is a powerful painkiller, it's going to block pain, it's, it's a lidocaine, it's been demonstrated to work, and we're going to understand how it works in your brain. Um, when we apply the control cream, we apply the same cream from a different jar, and we say, this is just to have something in your skin, it's not going to help you or change your pain experience in any way. After that, we give this uh, manipulation period. And in this manipulation, we would stimulate the skin at these two sites, the green the on the placebo site and the red on the control site, so each person serves as their own control. The purpose of this phase is to increase the expectation that the cream is actually going to benefit them. So we've told them that it's going to work, and we say we're going to stimulate your skin at level 8 in both sites, so it's going to be hot, hot. And what actually happens is, here on the control site, they get to level 8, but on the placebo-treated site, we reduce the temperature to level 2. And we think really there are two different things that are happening, and I won't get into the, the details uh, of this now, um, but we think that we're enhancing the expectations. Um, and we also think that we might be facilitating a learning process that occurs partly independent of people's expectations. Uh, so we now think that, that, that placebo effects are only partly under your conscious control. And this does both of those things. Finally, uh, this is the test phase, and this is the critical phase where we're going to look at the outcome. And here we stimulate two different patches of the skin so that there's, there's, there's no actual sensitization of the skin. Um, and here we're giving the same exact temperature, a level 5, on both regions. And we counterbalance the, the sites and we counterbalance the order of the, of the, um, of the testing on the two sites um, so that there's no experimental confounds. And the idea is the difference in pain reports between these two conditions is the placebo effect, placebo analgesic effect. That's the difference in pain ratings. And we're going to look for a similar difference between, uh, in the brain, between responses when you're getting the stimulation under these two conditions. And those are the placebo effects in the brain. If that's unclear in any way, stop me and ask me now so that we don't lose you. <laughs> um, and if you don't, I'll assume that it is <laughs> and go on. Okay. And this is what happens behaviorally. We put this, this cream on and test both of these sites. And when people get stimulation on the placebo-treated site, uh, there's a reduction in pain. It's about a 22% reduction in this study. This is uh, about 50 people. And, um, and about 76% of this sample showed uh, the effect in the right direction. We're, we're placebo responders, um, if you will. Um, so there's a substantial drop in pain. And this has been found in many other studies. I've listed some of them here, but there really are dozens of studies like this that have shown similar things. So you report less pain. The critical results, um, I think, are the brain results. And um, I'll just give you a sort of a high-level summary again. And what we see uh, is reduced responses to painful stimulation with the placebo in several of those areas that are pain responsive or pain processing regions that I showed you earlier. And those include the rostral cingulate cortex, which has also been associated with other kinds of affective pain modulations in particular, like effects of hypnosis. Um, um, and others, the, the insula, here it's mid, also anterior insula, and the thalamus, this is really extending here into the parahippocampal cortex and thalamus. So those three areas, the rostral cingulate, the anterior insula, and really the medial thalamus, um, are the three that I'm going to focus on because those show the most reliable down regulation when you get a placebo treatment. Um, so some, in many of these areas, um, the, the decrease in brain activity was correlated with the decrease in pain reports as well. So you can see that here for the rostral cingulate for both studies, the larger the behavioral placebo effect, the drop in pain, then the larger the drop in brain activity as well. Um, this study also gave us some clues as to what the potential mechanisms of placebo analgesia might be. Uh, and here, what you're seeing is um, a plot that shows we found increases in, during anticipation of pain in this area around the, the PAG, aqueductal gray, and, and the dorsal raphe nucleus, which are both important in descending modulation of pain. And those um, showed up, and they also were correlated with increases in the prefrontal cortex. So we also found increases in the, in the lateral prefrontal cortex in both studies, on both sides, and the larger the prefrontal response to the pain with, during placebo, the larger the increase in the midbrain. So that, and that, that you can see in that scatter plot there. And that's important because 
the, <clears throat> the lateral PF prefrontal cortex and medial prefrontal cortex both send projections directly to the PAG, which sends projections directly down to, um, well, through the rostral ventral medulla and some other nuclei down, down to the spinal cord and actually is capable then of affecting nociception at a spinal level early on. It's also important because opioids themselves and the PAG are major targets for analgesia in humans and animals. And this has been done in, in many, many studies um, over the, the decades. Um, and because of the second point that I mentioned before, that if you block opioids with naloxone, you can reverse those behavioral placebo effects. So this made us think that the opioid system was, uh, was likely to be involved in this. And then what we're seeing is, is the PAG uh, and part of the descending modulation system. So the next the logical step really was to do a study using PET to look at opioid system activity directly. And what you're seeing here now is a map of areas with the same kind of setup, right? Every person gets both placebo and control, the temperatures are identical, so the stimulus intensity is identical, and the differences you see here reflect endogenous opioid release uh, when people get a placebo treatment relative to a control treatment. And what you see here, I'll point out some of the areas. The green, green areas are the areas that we looked at, that we, we identified regions that were of interest before we started the study. Um, and this is the PAG. So we see opioid release here in the PAG in the midbrain. That's important because this is a major producer of opioids and sends projections up to the forebrain and, and, and other parts of the, uh, of the cortex. Um, as well as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex here, the anterior cingulate where I showed you the correlation before, the lateral orbit of frontal cortex, um, which, as I'll get to soon, is probably quite important for um, emotional appraisal and for, for essentially uh, creating the placebo analgesic effect. Okay, so we see direct evidence for endogenous opioid release. Um, since then, other labs have also produced a number of other results. There are now maybe 30-something um, published studies of placebo analgesia using brain imaging methods. Um, and those were some of the first ones. Since then, this is another group in Germany, um, Ulrika Bingel, and, and they found this ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, under placebo treatment showed increased connectivity with both the PAG, which might be expected, and also with the amygdala. And this was another study um, by a German group, Falk Eipert and Christian Buchel, and what they're claiming in this study is that when you get painful stimulation with the placebo versus the control, there's increases in activity here in the PAG, the hypothalamus, and what they're here calling the rostral ventral medulla. But I leave it to the, the pain group to decide if this is really the, the RVM uh, or not. <laughs> I'm not sure, but we, we are definitely moving towards trying to be able to image this at a high resolution and really try to, to dig into that, that lower brainstem system. Um, uh, so all that supports the idea of, um, of descending modulation of nociception. And this was another paper which, which was really striking. Uh, what they did is they actually imaged the, the C-spine here in the spinal cord um, using fMRI. And this is the cord here across. And this little spot here is a spot which showed reduced responses um, to, again, painful heat with the placebo treatment. So here's without the, without the, um, without the placebo, here's with the placebo. Um, so they published that a couple of years ago. So that suggests that placebo effects can reach really all the way down to the spinal cord under certain circumstances. And we're working hard now to figure out when that's the case. Another study that we did recently uh, can help give us an idea about the circuit dynamics or how this process might unfold um, across time. And this paradigm also produces particularly powerful effects of, of expectation. Uh, in this case, what we're manipulating is not the belief about the treatment itself, a cream, but the belief about the upcoming pain. And so here, um, again, in my abbreviated version for this, t this talk of, of the, the paradigm, we essentially gave people two kinds of auditory cues that were counterbalanced. One signaled high pain, one signaled low pain. And we gave them some experience that that was the case, that the high pain cue leads to the high pain uh, stimulus, heat, and the low pain cue leads to the low pain stimulus. And what we then started to do is intermix stimuli that were at an intermediate temperature um, that were the same temperature for both the high and low cues. 
So now, again, we're holding the stimulus itself constant, and we're asking, what are the effects of the cues themselves on how you experience and how your brain processes uh, that painful heat? Mm. And so we're interested in what the effects of cues are on your pain experience, right? Uh, at a constant level of, of stimulus intensity. And here's what we find. <clears throat> when you get a low Q and low heat, this is what you get. When you get a high Q and high heat, then the pain is, is much greater. That's as expected. Now the critical conditions in the middle. What happens when you get the same intermediate level of heat with a low versus high Q? And there, there's the difference. And this was actually true for, I think, 29 out of 30 people in our sample. So it's really reliable. <laughs> it was a very strong effect. Um, it works. <clears throat> so the pain is really quite different. All right. Um, and now um, I'll show you what happens in the brain. Um, what happens when people are experiencing that heat when they, got, when they get the high Q compared to the low Q? And what you see is I'll just focus on these areas in yellow because these are all the areas that show increases. You see increases in, in the lateral prefrontal cortex, the insula and the cerebellum, also this ventral striatum and amygdala, and this is all referred to later as sort of value learning uh, circuitry, um, as well as some of the areas that are most closely associated with pain experience. Uh, the insula is one of them, and S2, the somatosensory cortex uh, extending into the posterior <laughs> insula is another one. And we also see increases in, you know, an area that's consistent. I'll call this pons or, or maybe rostral ventral medulla that's consistent with that in, in the other uh, Falkheipert study. So it looks like when you expect more intense pain, um, there's really this whole set of, circuit, of, of circuitry that, that's responding, including some of these early uh, um, pain, responsive and pain modulation areas. And then we used uh, what Richard mentioned in the introduction to mediation analysis to try to understand more about how the brain activity relates to pain reports at a more fine grain level and how those cues um, influence that activity. So what we did is we looked for areas uh, that formally statistically, statistically mediated the cue effect on the pain. So what does that mean? That means the area has to respond to the high expectancy cue and it also has to predict how much pain people reported for a given Q level on a trial by trial basis. Right? So these are areas that essentially connect up the Q effects on the brain with the brain effects on the pain report <laughs> uh, and sort of connect the dots. And what we expect is a much more uh, circumscribed set of regions and we really expect those regions I showed you before, the rostral cingulate, the medial thalamus and the anterior insula because those are the most reliably influenced. And, and um, that is actually what we saw. <laughs> and so these are these three areas here, the rostral cingulate, medial thalamus, and, and the anterior insula. And they have all these properties. So we really think that these areas are most closely tracking uh, uh, the heat, and they're linking the expectations to the actual changes in, in pain response. And then we could ask, well, what's happening? You're getting these cues. What's happening when you respond to this tone and you start to feel either threatened or safe, <laughs> essentially, uh, that, that is linked to those changes in heat. So now what we did is we used these regions as the outcome and said, well, what's happening during the anticipation of pain that's mediating the effects of the cues on these changes in brain activity? And what we expect is one of two different things. We might expect there to be a sort of lateral frontal information processing based you know, modulation of those regions directly, or we also might expect changes in essentially that valuation circuitry, what I've called the ventral striatum um, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And we didn't know which of those things it was going to be, what these mediators were going to be. And what it looked like is the value, the latter, the value. So this is, this is the area around the nucleus accumbens here, and this is the area in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So greater activity here during the anticipation of pain essentially sets the stage for greater activity here, which leads to greater pain report. Mm. Okay. Um, and, you know, there, there are a number of other studies to choose from. I won't have time to go over all of them, but I picked a few studies out that help to underscore the importance of this subcortical valuation circuitry in, in, in the process. And, and the idea is that understanding this circuitry and whether an individual person responds uh, more strongly or less strongly in these regions um, can help us understand who's going to show a placebo response and who's not. 
And I actually won't talk in detail about that now just for, for time reasons, but I'll show you a couple things from several different labs that illustrate the sort of space of things. Now this is uh, a study from Jean Carzubieta's lab, and I, I chose it really mainly because um, this is the only study to do in the same people opioid and dopamine imaging. <laughs> so it's very methodologically special. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is, I'll just focus on the left-hand side, placebo responders, those who showed analgesia versus those who didn't, non-responders, um, showed less. And what you're seeing here is mu opioid increases in the area around the nucleus accumbens in ventral striatum, which we had also found in our 2007 paper, uh, and increases in dopamine <coughs> response in those same areas. All right. And this is important um, because those areas um, Dopamine in particular is actually involved in all kinds of, of value learning responses, especially, well, especially on the positive side, but maybe on both sides. Uh, so this is another study that also shows an in individual difference effect that converges on the same area. This is done by Petra Schweinhart uh, and, and Kathy Bushnell. And, um, and what you're seeing here is um, a set of relationships between, between three measures. Uh, one is here, the placebo analgesic response. So here on the right, greater, um, farther to the right is greater placebo analgesia. And here what they're looking at is gray matter density measured with structural MRI in the ventral striatum. So the greater the gray matter density here, apparently the larger the placebo analgesic response. Um, and um, that gray matter density was also correlated with a, a sort of a broad-based personality measure that includes uh, optimism, which has also been found in several other studies of placebo analgesia as, 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 a, as a predictor of individual differences. Optimism and this uh, behavioral activation, sort of behavioral drive, a high risk preference, and so on. So these are the, in some sense, the go-getters <laughs> who are showing the gr higher gray matter density and the larger placebo analgesic response. Um, in another study, we have found this. We looked during the anticipation of pain and we showed changes in, in two systems that are important. And again, I'll just focus on, on the yellow areas mainly. The lateral prefrontal and parietal cortex here um, and the orbit of, lateral orbital frontal cortex, right, which are involved primarily in the, the maintenance and manipulation of information and the specific expectations for specific outcomes in, in animal studies. So maintaining a cognitive representation of an outcome in particular. So we found both of those systems are important. We also saw correlations in the ventral striatum that I'm not showing you there. So if you put these pieces together and you look at what are the most consistent placebo effects across these laboratories to date. This is a, this is a meta-analysis or a, a summary image um, from the 30 or odd so studies that have been published so far that show consistency across laboratories. So to show up in blue on this map, there have to be at least three different studies who report the same kind of finding within 10 millimeters of one another. Um, and these are, these are the areas that show up, and they are the areas that I've been talking about, hopefully unsurprisingly now. The, the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, the medial thalamus, um, and the anterior insula. And this also extends into the cardia a little bit. Um, so those areas are really consistent. What about um, somatosensory regions? What about S2? Uh, and I actually, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve talking more about those things for, for another day when I'm here. So if you're really curious, you can, we can talk more later. But let me suffice it to say that those effects are, are not so consistent. We, we found them in the one study that I showed you, um, but we had very strong behavioral effects as well. And, and I, think, um, I think actually that the, the, the difference between who gets this somatosensory changes and who, who doesn't really depends on um, exactly how you do the study. Um, and, and I think uh, the ones that, that actually involve more <coughs> learning, longer and deeper learning processes, uh, are going to be the most important ones. Okay, and this is just to show you that broadly speaking, this is this, again, this representation of the high versus low pin from our lab, and you can, you can see some of the correspondences between those, those areas. All right, so it's not all of them, but it's many of them, um, especially the ones that are most closely associated with pain affect or the emotional experience of pain and the value of pain. Um, and the red areas here are areas that show consistent increases in activity across laboratories. And those, um, those include here the PAG, the periaxial gray that I told you about, the lateral orbital frontal cortex, and also the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, interestingly, because it actually responds during anticipation um, and it goes down during pain experience. Uh, and the lateral frontal cortex here. Okay, so we have consistency across labs. 
Um, now we're starting a program of research that asks, are placebo effects then, what, what are they at a psychological level? And one thing you might think is that they just boil down to uh, effects of distraction. So if you get the placebo treatment, you think I don't have to pay attention to this as much, and you might distract yourself, pay attention to something else. So that's, that's possible. And there's actually some evidence that, that suggests that that's the case. So, um, there are placebo effects in, in a group of Alzheimer's patients who have lots of pathology, admittedly. Um, placebo effects correlated with, with uh, frontal lobe function in a battery of tasks. Um, and another study, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a magnetic pulse that's delivered to the, to the lateral prefrontal cortex, actually disrupted placebo effects in that study. So those are interesting, interesting findings. So our prediction was, if placebo effects and cognitive control or attentional resources share common resources, they should either enhance one another or interfere with one another. So I'll walk you through the predictions and the task, uh, the basic design. So what we did is we gave our standard placebo test here. So they either got a placebo or they didn't in different sessions. And half the time when they got the placebo, they were doing this working memory distractor task, and half the time they weren't in, in each of those two conditions. So that way we could look for the interactions between them, whether they interfered with one another or not. And the working memory task was one that we had shown previously that really interferes with pain. You have to remember a series of letters, and every time you get a letter, you have to say whether it matched the one three letters back. And so it's a very well-studied, you know, sort of standard um, task. And we did it in a way that uh, ensured that it would be really continuously distracting, <laughs> essentially. Um, so one alternative it looks like this. Um, if they require common resources, then when you're really highly distracted, uh, the placebo effect should be reduced. <laughs> and that pattern would look like this. Um, on the other hand, it's possible that when you have that distraction, that really lets the placebo do its job and work better. Um, so in that case, when you have the distracting task, the placebo effect would be larger <laughs> because it would be facilitated by, by the availability of something external to you and to the pain itself to pay attention to. And then the third alternative is that they're parallel lines. Uh, which would suggest that they require different processing resources. Doing something very cognitively demanding in this case would neither enhance nor disrupt uh, placebo effect. And the results of this study um, are here. <laughs> and so what you see is that those effects were, were additive. So in fact, you know, being highly distracted did not interfere with the, um, the expression of the placebo analgesia. So based on that and a few other findings, we now think that it, it's not really reducible to distraction or, or, or attention at all. It's really a change that is centered in the value systems of the brain and in learning and value systems, which is also why I picked on those individual, diff individual different studies that showed the effects in the ventral stratum, value-based systems. So this is qualitatively different system than this attentional orienting system. Okay. So in the last... Um, five minutes or so, right? Maybe? Five, four minutes? Um, so far, before we go to the last, last part, um, we've, I've shown you something I hope about what placebo effects are. They're modulation of affective and or nociceptive activity um, that result from changes in conceptual processing systems, lateral prefrontal cortex and, and conscious expectations, and also value learning systems in the, in the ventral stratum and related circuitry in amygdala. And what placebo effects are not really uh, is uh, self-deception, uh, distraction, or a pure judgment and decision-making effect. Not to say you couldn't have those effects, right? But what we're observing here uh, is not that. Mm. So really I've talked about two potential endogenous regulatory systems. This frontoparietal system here in purple, um, which relates to attention and sensory motor expectation, and probably plays a supporting role in developing placebo analgesia by maintaining information about the current context, the environment that you're in, and what the cues are. And then this medial orbitofrontal frontal subcortical ventral striatal PAG uh, <laughs> valuation system um, that controls essentially the, the, the value assigned to a stimulus, like a painful, painful heat or something else, um, and learning about that value. So a summary of the working model is that there are these multiple um, feedback loops at different levels of the near axis. And these valuation changes here, and that's the nucleus accumbens here, um, project down to these systems, influence 
both the central and potentially the spinal um, effects of pain in some cases. And the VMPAC is going to be really important in, in, in modulating those, those processes. So it's really a model where there's multiple controls, at, multiple control systems at multiple levels of the, the neuraxis. Um, and now in the, in the last couple of minutes, I'll just make this point that now if we start from the brain and we say, well, what is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the ventral stratum, what are they involved in? We find that they're actually involved in a number of different uh, normal and pathological states. And they include uh, autonomic and endocrine regulation. Um, they include threat and the regulation of threat. These are all, I'll just breeze through these findings, but they're all in, in this paper here. Uh, and basically, we're seeing the same sort of ventral medial PFC systems in each of these cases. Um, um, that, that modulate how you feel uh, in terms of anxiety, in terms of subjective stress, and also how your heart rate responds, for example, um, to, to, a, to a stressor. Um, monetary valuation, um, and interestingly enough, memory and self-projection, and they're also uh, implicated in a number of mood and anxiety disorders. So this is, uh, this is fear extinction recall in PTSD. This is a meta-analysis of PTSD showing hypoactivation in this area in PTSD. Um, and this, this is some, some sort of famous older findings by Wayne Drevitz um, for uh, depression, right? Um, so decreases in, in, in depression. Um, and so what we think is happening then, if you put these pieces together, um, is, uh, is what I'll tell you actually right now. But, but to help us, before we give you the final punchline, um, we can look across many different tasks. And one of the things that we've done in my lab is put together this database. Each of these little dots is a point, as a published coordinate from a study. There are 5,800 studies now. And you can actually search them online. And you can search them in relation to the actual full text of the article and what the papers are, are talking about. And so we're using this to, to do meta-analytic summaries of, of consistent results across many different kinds of studies. And this can actually give us a new picture of what the VMPSC is doing, not just in uh, pain, but in these other kinds of affective conditions as well. And so these are eight maps from about 1,100 different studies that, that are published. And what it shows in this case is common ventral medial PFC activi activity when this is when you're doing nothing, actually just resting in the scanner, thinking whatever thoughts come to your mind. <laughs> it's high. Um, memory retrieval, especially autobiographical memory, thinking about yourself, how concepts relate to you, um, mental, mentalizing about um, other people, um, uh, all kinds of emotion generation, all kinds of reward and valuation tasks. How good is this? How much do I want this now? Um, autonomic regulation. And, and pain is actually special because it doesn't actually respond. It does show up here, but it doesn't actually respond. To the VMPFC doesn't respond to the input itself, but it responds to contextual modifications that shape pain. Um, and when we look at what these areas are doing across the two, there really are a couple of different broad factors. One is this memory loading up context in your explicit memory, thinking about what happened to you now and what does this mean for you. Um, and the second one is this group of, of uh, emotion and reward and, and autonomic changes, <coughs> essentially, peripheral changes. And the ventral medial PFC is the intersection between those two, those two groups of things. So we think that it's important for uh, essentially using specific experiences to construct expectations, not just based on what you've experienced a million times, but based on something that you might have experienced only once, or something that you just believe, or something that somebody told you. <laughs> Right, so this is the critical sort of entree for conceptual information into the system that creates the, the learned placebo response. And um, not surprisingly, uh, these systems have shown up in a lot of different contexts. Um, the anatomist Joel Price called them systems for survival. Uh, he also called it the, apparently the why care <laughs> system. Right? And so the idea is that the, this ventromedial and orbital frontal cortex network sits at the top level of a hierarchy that goes through the subcortex and down to these brainstem systems like the PAG and the hypothalamus that are important for <coughs> regulating the body, uh, the autonomic and the endocrine systems. But they're not just output systems. Um, um, they're also important in a number of other ways. So the PAG itself isn't just an autonomic output. It's really important for generating all kinds of different emotional affective responses across different domains. And so if you look at the PAG here, it's a sort of blow up. 
it has these longitudinal columns of cells, and if you stimulate different columns of cells in, for example, a cat, you get different patterns of activity, and they're all different patterns of responses to threat, and they're all associated with analgesia. So these are sort of hyperactive, you know, fight, flight, and then this is this hypoactive uh, give up, learned helplessness kind of state. And so they're all different kinds of responses to threat. Um, and there's a learning component to them too, right? So the idea that we have now is that over time, um, the activity, the responses in this system and the responses to the pain itself is shaped over time by this conceptual information. And so the, the, the belief itself in a treatment can over time modify what you learn about how, that, how, treat, how effective that treatment is, right? And that looks something like this. There's these systems here for, for encoding essentially the primary aversive value of pain, which involves the PAG and, and other places. There's this associative learning system, which is primarily subcortical, involves the, the thalamus and the amygdala and the, and the PAG and other areas as well, which encodes these relationships. You know, you get pain now, that's bad. You know, this cue means pain, that's bad. And then there are these systems for meaning construction that get information from the hippocampus for long-term memory. They also get feed-forward projections from this learned value system and from other systems that represent social information and other kinds of information. And it puts the pieces together. And then it has descending control over these other systems. Um, so it can shape both the experience and, over time, uh, the learning. Uh, so looking forward, um, you know, I think we now believe that placebo effects are active neurobiological processes related to meaning and learning systems, and that can help us understand uh, other systems as well. And there are placebo effects in many other systems that I won't go over, but think there are then relationships with other kinds of meaning-related processes, like uh, the, the voluntary regulation of emotion that plays such an important role, I think, in, in, um, in therapeutic, psychotherapeutic processes. Um, other kinds of variables that also depend on the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, like the perceived control and self-efficacy, um, and other kinds of things like persuasion and valuation effects, <laughs> as well as a number of different kinds of disorders. Um, Parkinson's disease is another one that placebo effects are, are actually quite prominent in and involves this ventral striatal dopaminergic value-related circuitry, um, as well as uh, addiction and, and depression. And just to give you a sort of final idea, you know, about depression, um, this is how it could apply. And, and these connections still need to be formed. So there's actually very little evidence out there. What we do know is that there are high placebo response rates in meta-analyses of antidepressant trials. Um, and placebo effects have been looked at in two different ways. One is to look at placebo treatment versus waitlist controls. And um, um, this has been done primarily by Irving Kirsch in a really very controversial set of studies and recently very controversial 60 Minutes interview. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but his analyses show the picture looks something like this across different medications. Um, people get better on their own. That's natural history. That's about two and a half, five, two, two and a half points out of the total 10 point improvement. The active drug effects are about another two and a half points and the placebo effects in his analyses are, are five points out of the 10. Um, Another sort of very clever way of assessing this is to, and this has been done by this group, um, Brett Rutherford and, and Stephen Roos at Columbia, who compare the outcome when people are getting the same medication, but they're in a comparator trial where they know they're going to be getting one of two effective medications, or they're in a standard double-blind trial where they know that there's a 50% chance of getting an effective medication. So they look at only patients that got the same medication from those two groups and compare them. And what they find is that being in a comparator trial is beneficial. There's a 60% versus a 46% response rate in one analysis, and then it improves the, the odds ratio is about 1.53. So there's a highly significant benefit, right, um, to just knowing that you're going to get something that's going to help you. And um, in, I think the only fMRI, or this is, not, this is a PET study actually, that I know of, um, this is by Helen Mayberg, She's asking here, uh, what happens when people get, um, uh, have a response across time to uh, actual antidepressant, fluoxetine, that's in red, um, and placebo, and, and both. And so what happens is um, increases in the lateral prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate, so some of the same areas that were implicated in our analgesia studies, really, and decreases in the subgenual cingulate um, in both conditions. Um, 
as well as the, as the insula. Um, and so this suggests that really, it's this at a broad level, this common circuitry is likely involved because, again, there are changes in essentially our assessment of, of meaning in both cases. And those relationships need to, to be explored. So just to summarize, this work that I've shown you is beginning to show at a brain systems level of analysis how and why concepts matter. And our philosophical or spiritual or healing traditions are, are rich with ideas about how to think about our experiences. Um, like this one, notions of heat and cold, of pain and, pain and pleasure are born of the contact of the senses with their objects. They have a beginning and an end. They're impermanent in their nature. Bear them patiently. And that's a way of thinking about pain and, and suffering. And, and so what we'd like to know is, and what we're beginning to understand, is why these ideas might have concrete uh, neurophysiological benefits. And that is the end. I'm going to leave you with this, um, this quote by the late Carl Sagan. No longer at the mercy of the reptile brain. We can change ourselves to think of the possibilities. This is no longer at the mercy of the reptile brain. We can change ourselves. Think of the possibilities. <laughs> there you go. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. <laughs>
If you can block the placebo using naltrexone, can you encourage placebo using some drug like Wellbutrin or something that raises dopamine? Right, so that's a great question. And I don't know of anybody who's tried to do that with dopamine, um, you know, pharmacology, dopamine agonists or antagonists. Um, um, but we'd like to do that. Um, but one, th one thing that has been shown to be effective is um, proglomide, which is a, a, a cholecystokinin antagonist, right, CCK, a and which is, which is very interesting because CCK inhibits opioids in the PAG, <laughs> um, and uh, apparently blocking, blocking CCK can, can um, help potentiate the opioid analgesic response, <coughs> that potentiates the placebo response. So that was, and that was done by uh, Benedetti et al. in 1995, mm -hmm. actually. But, but it hasn't been replicated since then, so it's ripe for uh, follow-up. <laughs> Has it been replicated and not found to be the same, or just not? No, I don't know if any other studies have published on it. Huh. Right, mm -hmm. so 